So I'm in the tent and I have a dog. I let the dog sleep in the tent with me because the mosquitoes are so bad. We're in the tent. It's 2 o'clock in the morning. It's July 23rd. Footfall. And I'm up on my elbows, reaching over, holding the dog like this. And I've got a rifle with me, but it's at my feet <laughs> in the tent. It's at the other end of the tent. And I'm laying here with a protective layer of mosquito screen right here. When all of a sudden, this bear appears silhouetted on the almost dark sky, but in pure form silhouette, stops right in front of me, three feet away. I think hearing about other people's experiences with bears can really help when you're in the moment too. Like if you hear about someone, like I had an incident with a sow and some cubs where I had a motorcycle accident and I was laying on the road and I looked up and the sow was on her hind legs and just I was like, oh my god, she's gonna, you know. But then you think about like, okay, well, you have that moment where you think about all the other people who've shared their bear experiences with you and obviously they didn't die or... You know, and, and there's there's something to be said about hearing other people's bear experiences and how they deal with them. And, and I'm looking at the bear, and I'm following its outline around, and I start at the back end, and I'm coming up over the rump, and all of a sudden I realize it's got a big hump on its shoulders, and I'm like, oh my god, is it good? And the grizzly bear, and I'm like, what am I going to do? And I'm like, I'll look at the dog, see what the dog's doing. I look over at the dog, and the dog's like, I'm just staring at the bear with its mouth open. I'm like, me too. They're dangerous. I like having them around. Then I know I'm in wild country. Uh, anytime I could, I could surprise one, uh, and and not survive. But uh, uh, I think it's worth it that the risk is worth it. And I'm like, what do I do? I can't go for the gun because the bear could pounce on me instantly. And that, I mean, the bear was closer to me than my gun was at my feet. And the bear's standing there and he's going. <laughs> and finally on the third whiff, he realized I hadn't bathed in a week. Almost everybody that lives in this community chose to move here from somewhere else. Um, very, very few people that live here were actually raised here. And so there was some reason why we all came first uh, to Alaska if we came from somewhere else, and then secondly to McCarthy Kennecott area. And um, it's in the middle of the world's largest national park. So you kind of have to understand right off the get go there's going to be bears. Me, bear. Angry. <laughs> Bear sway head, bad, bad. <laughs> nobody out, I mean, nobody that spends enough time out here is stupid. You just can't be. I, and not just in terms of bears. Bear consciousness. There's a lot of things, a lot of things besides bears out here, you just have to be conscious of all the time. You have to have your head on all the time living here. <laughs> and so that's just one of the items where you have your head on. I would hope that if it's just too much inconvenience, the person does not choose to live out here. I don't, if, if you live out here, you have to be willing to do bare measures. If you want to live in a, you know, if you want to live in suburbia, there are a lot of suburbias where you don't have to think about bears and wolves. But out here, you do. And I think people need to be bear aware, you know, in bear country. And somebody, especially somebody from the lower 48 that knows nothing about how to stay safe in bear country, they do need some sort of uh, education. But I think the general local population out here that lives with bears on a daily basis, they know how to protect themselves. And he snorted, he blew his nose, shook his head, and bolted into the woods, straight through thick brush. It's different being in a place where you're not necessarily the top predator. And here it's, it's primarily the, it's the bears that create that difference. It makes me aware uh, of a presence that I otherwise wouldn't be aware of. I jumped up, 
grab the zipper, unzip the zipper, reach out, got the dog's leash, tie, hook the dog up so the dog wouldn't chase the bear, grab my shoes, jumped out of the tent, ran over to my truck, which was just like 10 feet away, and used my shoes to beat on the hood of the truck. Boom, 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 make lots of noise. And my heart was pumping big time. The adrenaline was just rushing out my fingertips. It was so intense. And I reached in the back of the truck and got a jug of gasoline and went over and poured it in the fire pit, you know, poured a bunch in the fire pit and then capped it and put it back in the truck and then lit a book, a whole book of matches and threw it in the fire pit. <laughs> Instantly had a 10 foot tall fire going. And then I opened the truck door and reached in and laid on the truck arm. It's like, oh my God, I just saw a grizzly bear. He was only three feet from me, you know. And by the time I got everything ready, I realized that I didn't have to sleep in the truck, that I could go back to bed in the tent. <sighs> Adrenaline gone, or at least mostly gone. So I went back in the tent with the dog, you know, and we laid down, the dog curled up, a tight little ball. I'm laying there listening intently for my little twig to snap. Because it was like, can I get back to sleep? And after about, oh, maybe 10 minutes of like just consciously laying there listening the dog went like this you know ears perked up pointed straight out <laughs> the tent i'm like dog and I'm like <laughs> there was no noise out there and she looked at me like right there wasn't and she curled back up in a ball and then i fell asleep uh we we enjoy having the bears around because as i say we have few enough conflicts with them that uh we just enjoy seeing these these beautiful critters it's i think it's yeah certainly is a part of the identity along with the mosquitoes and <laughs> but a much more exciting and <laughs> positive aspect than mosquitoes there was his canine fang marks in the bag where he took a bite and ripped it open like this and i measured it with my fingers like this and i'm like <laughs> that morning i can remember doing this it's like Oh my God, you know, one bite, there goes my arm, you know, rip. You know, I'm imagining all the worst things that a bear could do to you. Well, I've decided, I, I don't, I say I do, do not fear bears. I decided I'm going to be afraid of bears when I see them. Like you spend a lot of time being afraid of bears when there's none around. So I've decided I'm not going to get be afraid unless they're, I, I know they're there. I, th I just, I just uh, accept the bears and their danger as part of living here. It's, it's every place you live has inconveniences and I, I embrace this one. He got into someone's ton of dog food. They were just plain brown bags. This bear then associated plain brown bags with dog food. So when he saw plain brown bags of cement, tested it, with his teeth. Well, he ate cement. And I often wondered if they'd find him shitting bricks in the woods. He found another cabin that was unoccupied that had about 14 cases of canned goods in it. And he proceeded to eat 11 cases of canned goods. He didn't eat <laughs> the green beans. He, he ate honey, he ate peaches, he ate pears. He, he you know, creamed corn, tuna fish, and it's like bears don't have can openers. He crushed every can with his teeth and squeezed the contents out. I was, my, my sense of black bears is that they're sort of like the raccoons that I encounter in down in Washington State, only bigger, so that, and they, they seem to do really well around people Grizzly is something else, and I don't know much about it, but I, I would have concerns about them because they're so um, sensitive to being around people, and the, the conflicts can be so much greater. He was a nemesis bear for three years. There's, I think, something like 11 lots in the subdivision I live in that are on the bluff that the grizzly bear trail was there before the state subdivided. So you have a state that subdivides land without having any idea 
of the nature of the land as it pertains to the beasts that live there. Well, it wasn't long before all the people that had houses or had land on the bluff and proceeded to do anything on their bluff lots were to learn that and they were on a bear trail because and, and I could tell you a story for every cabin out there. Um, land is developing out here. It's being subdivided and people are putting up cabins. Some locations are on customary bear travel routes mm -hmm. and there's going to be trouble at least at the beginning I think in some cases, they're not left with a lot of options except going close to people's places. So I think that is an issue. I mean, at the base of Fireweed Mountain, we know there's a bare highway, and some people are impacted if they're living there. There's more people on McCarthy Creek. There's more, there's, there's more people everywhere. And so, yeah, I think that all those corridors are going to be hit. And, and if those people aren't careful, then it's, they're just going to keep coming back. He, he would get in the back of my truck, which was full of household goods, and he would throw everything out every night. You know, and every day I'd go down there, and I have some photographs of that stuff. <laughs> Where there's just shit laying all over the parking area down there. You know, and, and none of it was food. It was like boxes of dishes. He smashed my brand new dishes that I brought out. <laughs> And then he took everything out, including a little stove. My very first stove was like this big. And he took it out and tossed it across the driveway, you know. And, and so that that was one of the few times where I've carried a gun. And it's like here I am trying to haul all my household goods home to my new home to spend the winter, and I can only make like three trips a day. It's, mile and a half, you're carrying 60, 70 pounds at a time, maybe more. So I load up my pack and I put everything back in the truck and, and I do my three trips for the day, no problem, but then you try to secure it at night and you come back the next morning and the bear's been there and tossed everything again. So this went on for three days. You take everything that's in the house and you imagine your very large like um, kitchen mixer electric mixer, you put it on high, and you scramble everything that's in the house. The furniture, the dishes, the food, the clothes, and you scramble it until there's a nice even sort of even layer over the floor, maybe two or three feet thick. And then you put a bunch of really kind of stinky saliva into it. That's it. And it takes, it, it can take a lot of cleanup. The bear came and he climbed on the hood of the truck and he smashed the hood in. And then he climbed on the roof of the truck. And he punctured the three cans with his canine tooth and sucked the beer out. And left the cans on the roof of the truck. He didn't even knock them off the roof. And then he jumped off the truck onto my bicycle, knocked it over, and put his paw through like four of the spokes and bent the front forks, which really made me mad. Because now he's injured my truck. He's broken my bicycle where I can't ride it. Fortunately, I had another bike with me. And I went to town going, who wants to shoot a bear? If the pol community is polarized around it, then you're going to have a side that would like to kill all the bears. And it's going to be driven by the side that wants to kill no bears. <laughs> So what's better is a, uh, a culture that is just careful. Well, when I biked into town to ask if anybody wanted to shoot there, as I was biking by Jurgen's, I noticed the door to his truck was open and there, there were two bags of garbage sitting on the ground just outside the door to his truck. The bear had broken into his truck, drug the garbage bags out. They didn't have any food value in them but smelled. And he went up the hill to Jurgen's house. And and at Jurgen's house, he marauded. <laughs> he ate through a bag of cement. Ate the cement, ate a pair of work gloves. Then he went to the next house. And that house, the folks weren't home, but their chickens were. And the first night, the bear ripped the door off the hinges. 
and the chickens got out, but the bear didn't get any. So now this is all like three days running after the bear drinks the beer at my truck. He poops out the gloves that he ate at Jurgen's, <laughs> and they're coated in cement, so they're like <laughs> this perfect pair of work gloves cemented like this in the shape of a bear fruit. Terry still has those. <laughs> They usually visit when we're gone in May, when we're, before we coming in for the season. They've come and checked out our house. Um, we have a bear tree right outside our woodshed, and they always rub some hair on it. And, and we have a couple of claws on our walls, but they're really just curious. I'll be working in the yard, and there will be a bear, you know, two or three hundred feet away, and he's looking at me, and I'm looking at him, and he's uh, grazing on the dandelions on the uh, airstrip and I'm doing my thing and and we kind of just say hey Al how you doing not bad you know and goes his way and we do our thing and, and um, he the second night at Terry and D's he ripped the door off and ripped a hole out the wall and got three of the six chickens I think some you know got some of the chickens he then proceeded to go to Rick and Bonnie Canyons the next night they figured out it might be the bear. So Rick turned on the porch light and there was the bear on his back porch trying to pry open his chest freezer, which was locked. But the bear was like, <laughs> trying to rip it open. As a general rule, if you uh, leave them alone, you know, they'll, they'll leave you alone. We see the bears only when they're out here on the runway. They see us whenever they want to, because they're in the woods, in addition to being on the runway, and they feel safe in the woods. And uh, so you probably have a lot more bear conflicts than what you're aware of. Uh, and I'm like, doo, 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 doo. and then I thought I heard like a yip, like a wolf or a coyote off to the right. And I had this fleeting moment in my brain where I was like, oh, that's private property. They wouldn't be there. And I was like, what? <laughs> I know, I was like, how did that, how did I get that kind of thinking? You know, I mean, does that, it's like, how? And I just remember laughing out loud and I just, uh, like, you know, and they're just here, and you know, our private property is their, you know, their domain. It's not, you know, they're not respecting land or, but you know, you keep your, you keep your shit at night. You don't, you know, leave trash out. You know, you just don't tempt fate. We are still surrounded by wilderness. If there were no bears, no wolves, no anything, you know, what, what would this be? Mm -hmm. It would be a theme park, you know, a great giant theme park, I think. And, and Rick proceeded to get his gun and crank open the kitchen window and shoot the bear behind the ear from 18 inches away through the screen, knowing that the bear had broken into the chicken houses and stuff. And it's like the bear was on a marauding outfit. And it's like word got back to me that Rick had shot the bear. It's like... At this end, we're going, ding dong, the bear is dead, <laughs> you know. It's like, it, this bear had lived its useful lifetime, had learned bad habits from a number of parties, myself included. Um, and he, he came to a bad demise. Well, when Rick went to look at the bear, he had no hair. I mean, his, his fur was like, almost all fallen out. I mean, he, he had scant hair. He didn't look healthy at all. His teeth were just attached by the gums. He, so he was starving. You know, and it, it explained why he was marauding, because he was no longer able to live a viable, natural life. There's been times when I've seen pretty big, black bears on the hillside here, but big ones, and I'm by myself. And you just have to, and it's not just the bears, it's, you know, the moose are just as much. And then you've got to figure out it's you and the animal. And nobody else is going to help you. And um, I don't usually carry, I don't care, usually carry a gun. And so it's a question of just working it out. And it's my responsibility. And the animal's going to do whatever it's going to do. So all those scenes come to my mind. And I think about what my life would have been without those scenes, and it would have been less. And what I would hope 
is that other people can have the opportunity for those kinds of experiences. Cleaning up the trashed houses, maybe not. <laughs> you know, you, you think with a gun and bears around, you might play out one of these Clint Eastwood scenes, these samurai scenes where you and your weapon determine your fate and it's a glorious way to feel. And uh, fortunately I never had to do that and uh, I don't feel that way anymore but uh, I think there's a lot of young guys running around hoping to, hoping to have a, a showdown.